Hello and welcome to Leviathan News. It's December 22nd. I hope you guys have all your Christmas shopping done. Uh, this is the last Leviathan News for the year of 2023. We're taking the week off next week so that we can touch grass and drink some eggnog and do all the Christmas things that you do and spend time with the family. But uh, today we have a special guest. We have Darren from IPOR who is here today to come and talk about interest rates, among other things. Uh, I didn't know this, but Darren is a 12-year a veteran in crypto. He's, uh, enjoys, the, enjoys the cycle, enjoys the volatility, um, which I, I, I was actually pretty surprised about this. Darren, you said you ran the largest, is there second largest crypto exchange behind MT Gox way back in the day? What a, hey. what a journey. Way back in the day, it's a different day. It's a different world now. Um, we predated Coinbase, uh, you know, oh, wow. unfortunately. Um, you know, at that time, you couldn't actually get venture capital. You couldn't get a bank account. As hard as it is to get a bank account now, <laughs> it was impossible then. And uh, we got thrown out of a lot of VC meetings uh, being called scammers and Ponzi schemers. Uh, so... You know, it's a little it's a little strange and crazy being on the verge of potentially multiple ETFs. Uh, it's beautiful, but it's uh, it's been a ride. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. How did you get roped into the first or the set with this crypto exchange? Yeah, so I was uh, I was I'm originally from the U.S. Uh, I grew up uh, about half an hour outside of Aspen, uh, Colorado. Uh, I left after the financial crisis i was working in actually property management and luxury real estate uh one of our clients was a day trader and that was kind of my first induction into markets uh, after the bubble burst i went down to chile and uh i played cards down there for a while um traveled around and actually ended up meeting this crazy group of expats they told me uh, we're starting a bitcoin exchange and i asked what was bitcoin um and yeah, they said it was a peer-to-peer -peer, like crypto anarchy bit torrent for money. And I had no idea what they were talking about. And I went to study the, the Bitcoin white paper, uh, as many resources that there were at the time. And it was fascinating. And actually, the, the most fascinating part to me was actually the difficulty adjustment for the mining, um, which is quite a cool thing. But I mean, the, the ability to put all of these kind of very elegant things together into software was quite crazy and I, I will tell you i had no idea that it would be this big of a phenomenon so what do you think about this new resurgence of bitcoin related transactions that are not having to do with actual swapping of, of monetary value but jpegs and cat pictures and god knows what else on the uh the bitcoin chain well i mean <laughs> at some point you know block subsidies will be very small and you'll need to actually manage the uh, transactions on chain you'll need to have some mechanism to pay the miners so i guess from that from that point of view you know it actually provides this utility so i mean i'm i'm fairly agnostic uh, you know i build and hold multiple chains i haven't done an on chain on a uh, bitcoin transaction in i think three four years so you know it's probably a good thing uh, you know for thinking about sustainability uh you know for the for the miners and actually power the network yeah it's such a interesting concept that you know you can buy bitcoin once and then you're relying on the the work of the miners to maintain the security of your holdings for all eternity um and that i mean that's you mm -hmm. know a lot of a lot of uh let's call them um you know, fundamentalists or, or purists say, okay, so there's no, nothing like, a, uh, you know, Bitcoin has the immaculate inception, there's no pre-mine, but, you know, um, who's maintaining the software, right? Bitcoin yeah. Core, it relies on donations, there is or was the, the Bitcoin Foundation, I know BitMEX subsidized some of the researchers, but, you know, a lot of people got very uh, wealthy off of this, and you expect that, you know, some of the smartest people will maintain the core functionality of the software without having any potential, even access to the upside or, or sustainability. So, and there's all kinds of thought around this, but I think that, you know, there will never be, uh, you know, a, let's say uh, this immaculate inception like Bitcoin again. And it really doesn't make sense, 
you know, to not have this kind of value, um, value incentive and value alignment between people who are maintaining the network and the actual network itself. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope that we're transitioning into a new state where Bitcoin's actually able to capture enough fees on a, on a regular basis to uh, maintain its security. I mean, that's really the, the end goal, right? And if it's, if it's cat JPEGs that, that do it, then, you know, it's a win for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so you've seen the ups and downs and the kind of the political machinations of the uh, entire crypto space move. Um, like, I, I guess as a builder, you've probably just become agnostic to everything. And every at this point, it's just that, you know, smart people come along, build new stuff that uh, people will find interesting. And uh, that's why we're here today to talk about I I IPOR, um, which honestly is was was. Uh, extremely novel because uh, you guys have been out for uh, quite a while and uh, I think you were the first protocol ever to do interest rate swaps on uh, on the EVM well uh, we're not the first actually there was there was a couple people that were looking at it in different ways right so it's more how we're thinking about it so uh, interest rate, first of all like interest rate derivatives in general is a massive um, asset class in in TradFi right it's the second largest financial market to forex mm -hmm. we're talking around uh, a little over 450 trillion dollars in notional value and this is the market that underpins the global debt market 450 trillion is a massive number it's multiples more than the entire market cap of all crypto uh, and the whole idea is that this enables fixed income uh, in traditional finance and this is basically half of the tvl in DeFi is in fixed income Right. So there were a couple of people that tried to do it with order book based, mm -hmm. but that requires that you need, of course, two counterparts. Right. Uh, other people that were doing something like perps on interest rates, which, uh, you know, if you can take a large loan right now, um, you spike up the interest rate. It's it's potentially, uh, you know, you can move the market. You can manipulate the uh, the interest rates on other or compound, uh, you know, if you have enough capital. Right. So it's very difficult to do that. Uh, so what we did was we took the peer to pool model. Uh, we took uh, a lot of actually fundamentals from quantitative finance. Uh, so we have a very strong quant team uh, on the modeling side uh, and really married them together. So we embrace the idea of first an index, something like the LIBOR or the SOFOR, but that's DeFi native. Second, the peer to pool construction and third, uh, basing it on traditional financial models. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, we, we kind of forget that interest rate swaps in the TradFi market are an extremely large market. Like it's, it's, it's incredible, right? Like, and perps yeah. and exotic derivatives are extremely small. Yeah. <laughs> right. But in, in crypto, we love the uh, speculative instruments, but the actual, um, m the ones that provide market structure, you know, we kind of shun because uh, we're not necessarily good risk managers as an industry. Well, hopefully with the, the ETF coming, we get more and uh, more defined and, and better risk management entering the industry. Uh, I know that uh, after the, well, over the 12 years that you've been here, I mean, you've pretty much seen everything at this point. So uh, in, in but the interest rate swaps are really the bedrock for the, the banking system, for uh, the financial economy at large as uh, companies and governments and banks uh, use these swaps on pretty much a daily basis to conduct uh, business activity. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're not sufficiently hedged, you have uh, blow ups like Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, you almost had the destruction of the UK pension system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lack of uh, lack of, inter you know, uh, sensitivity to interest rate risk is also a really big deal. So where, where is that risk going to manifest itself in crypto? If we're looking at it well first of all i mean so uh, the first instruments were underwriting uh the interest rate to, um the ipor the ipor index rates which are actually being sourced from avian compound on the stable coins usdt usdc and DAI. right and these are all individual markets they're isolated markets they have their different uh interest rate uh activity um we see a lot of innovation coming on. Uh, you have a couple of different things like Morpho Blue, Ajna, uh, other 
credit markets coming on, you have some more fixed income, uh, more longer duration instruments. Uh, you know, of course, you have notional finance, you have term structure and term rate finance. Uh, and so these, uh, these, I think, they'll change the interest rate dynamics. But, you know, one of the things is that you need to protect your interest rate risk, especially if you're doing like something like a, a leverage fault strategy, uh, you know, where you're, you know, borrowing against one asset. Let's say, you know, as this cycle is actually inverting, let's say you have an RWA, you actually want to borrow against it to get access into this DeFi yield, right, to actually... Uh, let's say freeze that income, you're going to need to use the interest rate swaps to essentially fix your rate, uh, you know, on, on both sides of a, you know, a basis trade. Uh, and then actually with the new product that we just launched, uh, you know, one of the interesting ones is the stick rate swap. So we call it the SRS. You have IRS for interest rate swap, SRS for the stake rate swap. And the first, uh, the first staking rate that we're underwriting is the, uh, the Lido uh, stake ETH rate. Mm. And so this is one, you know, where you can create much more complex uh, structured products and strategies. Yeah. So like just a really basic structured product would be something that's taking advantage of like the fixed versus floating yield. Um, yeah. You know, fixed yields are usually lower. So I'd, I'd want to buy a fixed rate and sell a floating rate. Uh, is it possible through IPOR? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly what is possible right now. So you have uh, in, in IPOR, you have the liquidity providers. So this is a passive depositor. Uh, the AMM is underwriting that risk and pricing uh, pricing the swaps and then the trader can come in and trade. Mm -hmm. right? So you can either take a, a pay fix, which is profiting when the rate goes up or receive fix, which is profiting when the rate goes down. Or if we look at it in the, let's say the Ethereum uh, sense, uh, if you're talking about the Ethereum staking rate, uh, structurally, you want to be receive fix if you believe that more stakers and more percentage of stakers are going to come on, which drives the average yield down. Uh, you might be tactically uh, pay fixed uh, if you think that, let's say, if you believe that we're going into a bull market, there's going to be a lot more on-chain activity. Uh, so actually, uh, you know, a pay fix position is a proxy to speculate on rising gas costs. Hmm. Oh, interesting. That's a, that's a, I hadn't thought about it that way, right? Where the rising gas costs generate more revenue for the stakers, which drives up the APR. And uh, in this case would, would increase the, the rate. So you'd want to be uh, essentially like bearish on the fixed rate and, and hoping for an increase in, in the yields. That's right. um, so like, how does that sensitivity get transferred over? So, you know, we're talking for the staking rate of, of, of like Steth or something, you know, it moves between like three and maybe 5%, maybe four and a half percent. So uh, with these, uh, you know, a percent and a half, 150 bit uh, APY movements, uh, like how do you get enough leverage to be able to take advantage of those uh, yield movements? I mean, you can actually take very high leverage without uh, taking on massive risk inside of interest rate derivatives, because it functions very different from a perp, uh, you know, a perp, uh, let's say, you know, 100x with a 1% movement, and you can get liquidated. Uh, an interest rate derivative is, is a bit different, an interest rate swap or a stake rate swap. You're actually trading the payoff on the underlying notional. So, for example, right now, the leverage on the stake rate swaps is 500x. Mm. Uh, and that means that, you know, let's say if it moves by, uh, you know, 50 bips, 100 bips, you are either paying or receiving the difference in the payoffs during that time period, right? So think of it as a game where you and I are sitting on two sides of the table. We have a pile of money. So let's say, you know, if you are the AMA, sorry, if you're the liquidity provider and I'm the trader, every time the rate goes in your favor, you may give me some, some chips or some coins. Uh, if the rate's going in my favor, uh, or, or sorry, vice versa, you know, when it's going in your favor, I'm paying to you. When it's going in your favor, you're paying to me. And at the end of this period, we take the net out of differences and the smart contract, it pays off the winner. So it's not like you can get liquidated, you know, very quickly. It's, it's a, it's a time-based payoff. So this is why you can take a very high leverage. And that's exactly what's happening right now. We have about 36 million in notional or about 15,000 ETH uh, in the first week of launch on the stake rate swap. Oh, nice. So how do you translate all this into like a retail based product that is approachable and something that can make sense for, for people? Because I, I, you know, interest rate swaps are kind of at the more complex end of the 
f financial, you know, wizardry that we do. Uh, so how do you how do you kind of create enough uh, availability for people on the kind of mid curve, left curve that that haven't dealt with these swaps before? Yeah, well, actually, in V1, we uh, we talked a lot about what is an index, what are swaps. Uh, and it was really engaging to about 5% of the community and the rest just glazed over, the, you know, their eyes got glossy and say, you know, okay, I'll go back to purpose, right? Uh, so maybe pushing the swap narrative onto retail users is not the right approach. And that's why we actually updated the, the branding to from, uh, you know, the IPOR index and the IPOR, uh, IPOR interest rate derivatives to the credit hub of DeFi. So actually, uh, you know, for most retail users, they're going to be on the opposite side. They're going to be the liquidity providers. So this has a value proposition that you are underwriting the derivatives. You are profiting from the uh, the fees generated by the derivative engine. Uh, you are also getting underlying yield. So we have an asset management screener so you can see where in other external protocols, you know, the uh, the, the the assets are getting yield, what the risk is. Uh, and so this is where I think retail will mostly be participants. And then on the other side, you have, uh, you know, let's say like the Arbitrum community that's very financially savvy. Well, we have a lot of resources on how swaps, uh, the swap payoff is calculated. Uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, a lot of content on the blog uh, about how to trade swaps. Uh, and then finally, uh, the I think the last piece of the puzzle is the structured products, basically a one click vault where you can leverage these different uh, yield trading strategies. Uh, and it's going to be, there's going to be this underlying uh, swap mechanism where you're going to be getting access to some yielding strategy and you're going to be taking an interest rate swap or a stick rate swap. And you won't even know it. This is just something that powers the strategy that you're going into. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, so I'm looking at the provide liquidity page. Let me just pull this up. Um, the yields are pretty good right now. Um, are you guys deployed on ETH or where is this deployed? Yeah, so it's deployed on Ethereum mainnet. Uh, and I think what it goes uh, kind of hand in hand with one of those uh, things that you were just talking about, which is that there's so much liquidity on the Ethereum mainnet uh, and also the Institute probably be on the Ethereum mainnet. So large gas fees compared to the sizes, you know, you were talking, uh, you know, 10 million plus uh, when you're taking the notional um, it's not going to be really affect them in terms of the gas fees, mm -hmm. but we are, uh, we do have a lot of internal, uh, DAO discussions and some proposals about being deployed to other chains, right? So one of the main ones is Arbitrum, uh, and I believe there will be a governance proposal that will be voted on that's coming sometime in Q1. Um, but yeah, so these, uh, these APRs are based on the power, uh, the power IPOR tokenomics. So if you go to, uh, if you go on the earn tab. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And go down to liquidity. This is something that really, uh, if you scroll down to this curve. So this is, uh, you're always going to take some, uh, some price risk in the iPort token uh, to get a boosted, a boosted reward. Uh, and so if you hover over the graph, if you go to that little kink, so uh, on the left-hand side, yeah. So this is holding 5% uh, relative to your liquidity uh, uh, provision in the IPOR token. So you purchase IPOR token, you stake it for power IPOR and use that to boost. So you can take more risk on the IPOR token, which means that you get a higher yield. Uh, but at some point on this curve, there is the most effective point. And typically that's around a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, and so you're taking always some price risk on the IPOR token for extra yield and vice versa. Uh, and so where the yield is coming from is uh, on this, it's one, it's coming from the underlying asset management. So uh, if you go to uh, analytics, mm -hmm. you can go to uh, asset management. And so you can scroll through this and see, for example, where the, uh, you know, basically what's the activity uh, you know, at any time, where are the funds being deployed? Um, you know, there's some native yield that's coming from the, the underlying credit markets. It's underwriting the derivative risk. Uh, and you can go see, uh, you know, where the fees are being generated inside of the inside of the protocol. Uh, so you really earn from a couple of different sources, asset management, uh, fees from swap openings, the net outcome of swaps and the liquidity mining. 
And so, yeah, this is the open interest. You can see the spike, especially on the stake rate swap, which is the one in the STE blue, right? And so we have currently around, I think uh, about 36 million in open interest just on that market alone. Hmm. It's interesting how the, uh, how you guys have been affected by the rising and falling of interest rates, right? Like this period right here during, uh, uh, back in October, when rates were hitting their peak, mm -hmm. uh, you saw the peak in kind of stablecoin demand. Uh, but then, as the rates have dropped for that, demand for that has dropped. But uh, it shifted into the uh, the Steph product, which I guess you guys have just launched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Uh, so it, it seems that there's a lot more demand for the for the Steph right now than the um, uh, than the stablecoins. Um, it's probably because the Again, the, like falling interest rates, and also uh, we've seen an uptick in uh, usage as prices have gone higher. Yeah, I mean, we're actually we're in a we're in a new volatility regime, and I would say that we're in that regime since uh, let's say late July inside of the stablecoins. So, you know, you have a lot all this hype about RWAs. Uh, you had a really late movement from for with people out of stables into RWAs. But now we've seen a shift back into, a, let's say, a risk on mode inside of DeFi, which means that more people are taking risks, more people are borrowing, which is spiking the interest rates, right? And actually, this is kind of the rate dynamic that the uh, IPO swaps were, were born for. So there is a new spread model being pushed, actually, as we speak, mm -hmm. which is going to tighten the spreads on the uh, stablecoin uh, on the stablecoin uh, swaps. Uh, because you know you can you can think that you can't you can price uh, you can price for many things, but you can't model for everything. So in a time when the average rate is moving between 10 and 15 percent on the USDC market, you know a, a new model needs to be used to price that. Hmm. Uh, so for for someone like me, like is, is the who's just coming to the platform, I would probably want to just come and deposit funds into the liquidity pools, right? And underwrite those, uh, those traders taking. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, the IPO pools have been, uh, let's say in the top, uh, in the top 15, uh, uh in terms of stablecoin yields, uh, for the past, uh, year and a half, actually, since the, since the product was uh, launched on Ethereum mainnet August of last year. Mm. So it is one of the best places to park your stables and now one of the best places to park your STE. It'd be interesting to see, is there any application to say like the perp dexes when we're talking about like funding rates and, and stuff um, to take like an average of, of funding rates? Cause uh, it seems that like the, there's probably some integrations that could occur there because there's, there's quite high rate volatility. Yeah, there definitely could be. Uh, we've had a couple of other people that have done that. Actually, uh, you know, we were talking about other swap products. So there was Strips Finance. Mm -hmm. uh, Strips Finance, uh, I believe, team out of uh, out of Singapore, uh, and they were doing interest rate derivatives. Uh, they were doing something more. Actually, I think they went more into like yield stripping. Uh, they didn't get much traction. They flipped to underwriting the um, the, the funding rate, and then they just turned into a perps dex. So I don't know if they found product market fit there, uh, but that could be an interesting one. Actually, you can think of the IPOR protocol as this kind of maybe more generalized volatility derivative uh, platform where you have one, which is a price input. So think of something like the IPOR USTC, USDT or DAI index or the IPOR uh, staked ETH index, which is the pricing in, uh, or the volatility input. And then you have a pricing model, which is the spread model and then you have the market so i mean yeah a lot of things are possible with this yeah hmm interesting defi advisor have you have you done any interest rate trading no i'm not as sophisticated as you guys <laughs> so i've just been uh, listening mostly but one thing did catch my attention and i wanted to ask you that mm -hmm. you said earlier about some uh, simplifying uh, tactics that you're gonna that you're considering offering some users like myself probably which are uh, still uh, probably at least a few years ahead uh, uh, in delay i'm sorry uh, in how to do all this kind of stuff that uh, the sophisticated users can obviously already uh, use uh, complex protocols uh, like on the financial aspect of things uh, like epo for example so do you uh, can you share a bit about like uh, do you even have like 
is it even worth your while to create a platform for uh, users like me or like some kinds of automation? Because uh, honestly, I'm, I'm uh, interested, but like I, I can't play this game. I need, I need less buttons, less decisions making, less decision making. And I'm very curious about uh, what you guys have uh, in mind there. Yeah, sure. Actually, uh, Sam, is it possible to bring back up the platform? Yeah, sure. I'll explain. So there's a couple of things. One, uh, we revamped the entire architecture. So we're using the Diamond proxy architecture so that you can route through the entire protocol in one click. So let's look at the state ETH pool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so inside of the zap in, uh, you can choose any token that you want and you can zap in and effectively choose your APR, right? So let's say you're going in with uh, USDC, uh, you want to put 100,000 and you want to get some access. You're effectively buying stake ETH, you're buying IPOR, you're staking it, uh, and then you choose your APR. So if you s select a token up there, mm -hmm. uh, if you select, the, let's say USDC, let's put like 100,000, for example. Uh, okay, so you can scroll the slider and you can look down uh, at the bottom and see basically what the uh, what the estimate is. Can you scroll down just a bit? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so you can see that you're actually buying, uh, you know, stake teeth, you're buying power iPhone, and you're delegating in some relation, and this gives you this desired APR. So all of this is uh, actually powered by the Diamond Proxy architecture on the smart contract side. Uh, we have an integration with Enzo, uh, which is doing the, uh, the, the the routing through the different order books. And that's a one-click product where you can effectively choose your APR and zap in as a liquidity provider. So think of this like one one-click concept, and this is all, also going to be going out to different yield strategies. So uh, it won't be just IPOR that would be uh, you know, being rooted through. But let's say, for example, you want to get some delta neutral exposure uh, on Ethereum. Uh, you know, let's say you're coming in through RWAs, you borrow stable coin, um, you or, or you borrow you you borrow stable coin, or you borrow uh, let's say the native asset. Uh, you want to take a you know you want you want to take an option on ETH, and you want to uh, you know protect your downside on the yield risk, right? Like you're trying to capture this, uh, let's say, delta neutral uh, stake, uh, you know, ETH staking rewards. So this is something that would require multiple strategies, multiple protocols, and it's probably going to be, uh, you know, want to be integrated with, uh, you know, a one-click kind of position. So this is an example of, let's say, different yield vaults, different yield strategies that you could see, you know, with IPOR. And that, where IPOR, actually, the swaps are one part of uh, you know, kind of this uh, trade. Hmm. So I I wanted to ask about um, I guess a more general question mm -hmm. is that um, like looking into crypto in 2024 because we are coming to the end of the year. Um, I understand that like uh, obviously like you think interest rates are uh, or interest rate swaps are are going to be uh, a growing market uh, as they have been in 2023 for 2024. Um, but uh, like, what other narratives in DeFi are you kind of tracking at the moment? Well, I do, I do have my head down a lot, you know, in the rate space. Uh, you know, I know that uh, what uh, restaking is is a big narrative right now. Uh, we always go through different cycles, right? But I, I don't pay too much attention, to be honest. To uh, you know, let's say a lot of the. Um, burgeoning uh, narratives. I, I try to stick to more fundamentals. And uh, this what, that's what happens, you know, for a long time, you become like a, an old man on a rocking chair on the porch, uh, you know, just uh, paying attention to the things that you know, right. But uh, I mean, I is uh, it, it's just it's a slower moving market than others, because you know, the interest rate dynamics, the credit markets, they change, uh, they change quickly, but then those changes in the interest rates, uh, you know, they'll happen over a more gradual period of time. So what I'm more interested in, in especially for the IPOR, is the institutional narrative, yeah. uh, because that is the capital that makes a big difference in this. And it's my view that a lot of the liquidity will flow through the fixed income space, right, where you're looking to, you know, effectively yield. Uh, so, you know, let's paint a very, very short picture. And this is something that we've been talking about. Yeah, on the IPO Labs team for the last year. Uh, RWAs are great, but 
we're coming to a tightening cycle because everything's breaking. Uh, and so that will re-invert the yield dynamics. So RWAs will become cheap. DeFi yield will yield higher. It will finally regain this kind of risk premium that you're taking for a smart contract risk. Uh, and from that, uh, you know, there will be a lot of different opportunities so with uh, different risk adjusted returns. And I4 is really focused on actually this kind of lowest risk adjusted return or let's call it the risk free rate if we characterize that by, you know, over collateralized. Uh, and so there will be a lot of different opportunities to actually come in through dollars. Uh, and this will be the institutional players that are looking to come in first through dollars, uh, take these complex strategies and, and just try to, uh, you know, farm the, the basis differential. Yeah. Can we talk about, I mean, you brought up restaking, right? So mm -hmm. restaking kind of breaks a lot of DeFi just by adding in all these new slashing conditions. Um, is it something that IPOR would be able to respond to? I mean, it's something that we're looking at. It's definitely something that we're looking at, but we're focused more, uh, you know, first on the core, uh, on the core tenants. So you can look at a, you can look at something like, um, uh, you know, receive fixed on the on stake rate swap as kind of slashing insurance, right? So anything as you lever up, you know, you get more exposure. And with more exposure, you actually probably want to take more protection, right? But restaking as an industry, we'd like to see how that plays out. Um, one of the reasons is, uh, you know, you don't have, uh, you, you don't know uh, very well the risks on the restaking side, what the rate risks are, what the slashing mm -hmm. dynamics are. So this is something that it takes time to see, it takes time to model. Otherwise, uh, you know, you need effectively an order book where uh, active market participants are basically pricing this on their own. And this is something that we don't see too much in DeFi unless you have a very well-established market, which is, let's say, an, enough players to build an order book. But in the bootstrapping phase, you if you use this kind of peer to pool dynamic with an AMM, uh, you need to really well know the risks and be able to price them. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, that is a good point that uh, you know, with without any historical data, it's hard to actually look at it. Um, so maybe in like a year or two, once we've seen it go live and uh, be implemented and, and have some testing data to, to, to run these back tests on, then maybe it's deployable. Yeah. Darren, are you guys already in uh, some, uh, like, you mentioned the uh, institutional capital uh, a few uh, minutes ago, like a moment ago. Mm -hmm. Are you guys uh, actively trying to uh, attract this kind of capital? And uh, when I mean actively, I mean, like, uh, are there talks behind scenes with, uh, with different uh, parties or entities on, uh, like, uh, channeling uh, their funds already and using uh, the system that you've built? Or is it more like of a... You know, whenever it comes, it comes. Or like, maybe I'm, I'm actually asking is how? How do how do we actually attract uh, this kind of capital to actually use uh, such uh, great products like uh, you and many other builders are building, which are uh, which are much more relevant to the institutional uh, investors than uh, for us retail uh, simple investors. Yeah. Okay. So let's say that there's a uh, three strategies now, short term and long term. Right. The Long-term uh, institutional strategy is something that maybe will come in a couple of years, right? Uh, so if you think of the branding, uh, it can be very meme coin. So, you know, a lot of people that say, oh, I poor is I poor, right? Uh, that you don't have any money, right? And, and this is something, it's okay. You know, it's maybe it's better than like Safe Moon or, uh, you know, like anything with Safe or... Um, because those tend to get hacked. So you already have your kind of worst condition factored in in the name. Uh, but the whole the whole idea, you know, kind of the long-term value is where, uh, you know, the, the IPOR index is something that, uh, the idea of a benchmark rate, you know, for DeFi is something powerful. And we actually see actually a lot of copycats in the institutional realm uh, that are trying to market it and also build it in the very, uh, you know, it's like CeFi way, which is closed door paid subscription you know, or, or paid index model, uh, where we're building it in the DeFi native way, which is public goods, right? So the IPOR is printed to chain, and this is your risk-free rate. And you can use this to structure uh, different things anywhere. Let's say if you want to give someone a car loan or a home loan, 
you can choose the choose to reference the IPO rates and use the contracts to hedge your risk, right? So these at some point will be piped in through the Bloomberg terminal where you'll have the uh, you know the old uh, the old guard uh, you know rates trader who is like, oh, uh, a LIBOR IPOR, I, I get it. This is a risk free rate where the IPOR swaps, right? So that's the long term kind of let's say branding uh, and um, alignment with TradFi. Uh, in the midterm and the short term, the short term, we're really targeting a lot of the crypto native firms. So a lot of the crypto native firms, the hedge funds, the, you know, these guys are doing some liquidity provision on IPOR, doing some of the swap trading. Uh, and they're also looking for some of these kind of vault strategies. Uh, and then in the middle, you know, kind of in the middle, we're looking at, you know, where are these, uh, you know, kind of different uh, funds that are coming online from traditional players. Um, and these, I think, are maybe the, the hardest to do because the way that they're structured, they may not be able to take on-chain smart contract risk and also with uh, non-KYC parties. So the idea of permissionless DeFi doesn't work with a lot of these players, right? So the question is, you know, how does this play out in the future? So I think that in general, in DeFi, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, protocols will have different segregated pools or products. Uh, we saw this with Ave and Ave Arc, which uh, you know it didn't get a lot of uptake because uh, and some of the you know some of the reasons that I heard were well whales need fish right so you know if you just have institutions if you just have smart money that is playing against smart money you know it's not going to work out so well so yeah I mean we do have a lot of crypto native uh, firms that are looking at IPOR that have deployed capital inside of the IPOR pools or are trading swaps, and we're looking to augment that with the structured product suite. Very cool. Um, well, that's great to hear. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to go try out IPOR in the next, over the, over the holidays to maybe do some yield trading on it. <laughs> so it sounds fun. You see, Darren, that's why he wants the vacation. That's why he wants some time off, like a week yeah. off, <laughs> to try uh, fifty thousand new DApps and have us uh, give us some content for the next uh, year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, very cool. Um, well, that's good to hear. I'm, I'm, I'm. I always like these more complex products uh, to learn about them, and uh, we've definitely learned a lot today. So, um, thank you for being here, and thanks for coming on to uh, Leviathan. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, really a pleasure. Happy holidays. Get some rest. Uh, hopefully 2024 will be a very action-packed year. Yeah. Amen. Cool. And thanks, everybody, for our, at home for tuning in. We will be back on January 2nd or 3rd, whatever that Tuesday is after the, after the new year. Um, but we're taking next week off. So uh, enjoy the holidays. Touch some grass. Well, it's kind of winter right now, but if you have grass where you live, touch grass. If not, then go if out and have, touch some snow. If you have inner grass within your house, you can uh, maybe touch that. Exactly. Uh, very cool. Thank you, everybody. And we will be back and see you in the new year. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks yeah. a lot for coming, Darren. It was